Good morning. It's been a while since I've been able to do any kind of a presentation or, or mini uh, talk for the year of the uh, Eucharist in the parish, but I'm back on doing that now. And what I wanted to reflect on for a little bit uh, today is the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, now, I don't really think that anybody here really cares about the historical act, uh, background of some of the new Eucharistic prayers or where all the prayer language comes from, but I just want to talk about the structure of the prayers. First of all, just, ob uh, just to observe that most commonly we refer to that part of the Mass as the Eucharistic prayer. It also has other names. Uh, it's sometimes called an anaphora, okay, especially if you're a liturgical person. And it's also, at least in, 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 in Eucharistic prayer number one, also known as the Roman canon. And back in the older days, it was just known as the canon of the Mass. So what's the structure of it? It formally begins with the preface, and it's a, a song of praise to God the Father uh, through Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's great. That's what the preface does. We have a dialogue back and forth. You know, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, etc., etc. <clears throat> then we have that prayer of praise and thanks that I sing. And your response at that point is, and in fact, I join in it, it's the acclamation the Sanctus, as it's called in Latin, holy, 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 and we sing that as an acclamation. So the, the overall quick structure of the Eucharistic prayer is, I say something, you all respond. I do something, you all respond. I do something, you all respond. And we're gonna talk about all that. So once the holy, holy is finished, then we have what is called a renewed declaration of praise and thanks. I'm cheating on my notes, don't mind me. And that is always, always, always directed to God the Father, okay? All of the Eucharistic prayer is dedicated to and prayed to God the Father, and that is important. But even in some of these sections that are uh, um, lead-ins, you might say, bridges, you might say, to the uh, invocation of the Holy Spirit, which I'm coming to in just a minute, they might be very short bridges. In Eucharistic prayer number two, it's only like one sentence. In uh, Eucharistic prayer number four, it's a lot longer, etc. Okay, so we have um, that section of praise and, and, and thanks that is directed to God. But for example, in the third Eucharistic prayer, we also make sure that it is Trinitarian by the power of the Holy Spirit through through Jesus Christ. So we can't really ever separate God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the prayer primarily is, is, is directed to God the Father. Then what we have is an epiclesis. That's a fancy Greek word that means the invocation of the Holy Spirit on the bread and wine to be consecrated into the body and blood of the Lord. So if you like, the priest doesn't do anything. The priest invokes the Holy Spirit who does everything. And that's, that's an important distinction too. My job as being ordained is that I am sanctioned officially by the church to invoke the Holy Spirit. So come back to that in a second. We invoke the Holy Spirit, and sometimes there might be a bit of language between the epiclesis, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, and the words of consecration, which are known as the institution narrative, because it's the words of the Last Supper where Jesus institutes the Eucharist. Okay, and that's great, that's great. So we do that, and we have the narrative of the institution, and again, it is not my words, I am saying the words of Jesus. Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Okay, that's important. Uh, in the early days of the church, St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan in the fourth century, was really strong on this in his catechesis. They're not the priest's words. They're not the bishop's words. They're not the pope's words. They are Christ's words. And since they're his words, who would ever deny it? In, in his own way, about the same time, St. Cyril of Jerusalem said pretty much the same thing. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit the words of Jesus Christ, and then the Eucharist is his body and blood, which gives us our salvation. Immediately after the Eucharistic in, uh, the, uh, institution, we have your response, the memorial acclamation, whichever one it happens to be, which we typically sing. So after the memorial acclamation, I continue the Eucharistic prayer, and we have a memorial remembrance, okay? It's called an anamnesis, another fancy theological word that means remembering. We remember what Jesus did, okay? We remember his passion, death, and resurrection. That's important because the Eucharist is known as a memorial, as well as a sacrifice, as well as a meal. 
So all of that is all put together, and that prayer immediately after the Eucharist, the Eucharistic um, institution is known as that remembrance or the anamnesis. Then we have what are sometimes called diptychs. And a diptych would be, okay, I'm gonna hold my notes up at this point. See the way it's folded? Two pieces of paper, right, kind of? Well, a diptych would be, actually, once upon a time, it would be a piece, a slate or something like that, or a little a wax tablet that you could write names on. One side would be for the living, one side would be for the deceased. And so our diptychs, we have, remember, Lord, those who have died. Remember your church, remember those who have died. We do those remembrances in the context of, of the Eucharist. And that's how we end the Eucharistic prayer with those remembrances, which almost every single time, in fact, every single time, every Eucharistic prayer ends with, through Christ our Lord, one form of that or another. Then it's time for me to do what is called the great doxology, through him, with him, and in him, lifting up the Holy Eucharist, and everybody responds, singing most of the time, Amen. And amen says, yes, so be it, I believe it, I want it, and that takes care of us. That is the story of the Eucharistic prayer. And that outline fits for the first four Eucharistic prayers that we know. It fits for the two Eucharistic prayers for reconciliation, and it also fits for the four Eucharistic prayers now that we have for special needs and occasions. So that's the variety, but it's also the unity. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.